We're just waiting for a few bo a few more folks. So Richard, can you? I, I guess you're on audio. You're you can hear us okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. All right. Yeah, we got a bunch of people who are still in the process of connecting here. Okay. Got some folks in the Susquehanna River Basin Commission coming in. Bill Brown on. Again, for those folks just uh, Logging in, we're just waiting for a few more minutes. We may start, according to my clock, it's about two or three after one. We'll give us people a few more minutes. Tyler, I guess you're on. Can you hear us okay? Welcome to WebEx. Enter your access code or meeting number followed by pound. Enter your attendee ID number followed by pound. If you do not know your attendee number, press pound to continue. All right. Anthony, I think we can still wait for a few more minutes. Um, we won't, for those of you on the line, we won't wait too long. We Got a lot to cover, and we want to make sure we get it all done within about an hour because I know a lot of you folks have other things to do after this. But um, uh, the, I believe we are going to get a few more participants. At least that's the confirmation I got earlier. All right. Bill Brown just connected. Tyler, did you call in on a separate line? Yeah, this is uh, Andy at SRBC. We were having trouble with the audio, so we dialed in on the phone line. Okay, it looks like you're both connected via the phone and your laptop. So I'm gonna mute your laptop. Okay, that sounds and great. Can and you, can you hear us okay? Yeah. All right. That sounds good. So I just labeled your phone, muted your laptop. Perfect. That helps with reduced feedback. Barry, you want to get, you want to maybe start with a round of introductions of sorts? Well, we can do that. Um, yeah, I apologize for having people wait. I, I, that's why I sent that email out uh, last week, trying to get a confirmation of how many people were going to join, and I got a lot more confirmations than are reflected in the list of participants so far, but we don't want to wait too long. Uh, in any event, so I'm Barry Evans. I'm with Penn State. Uh, I think I know most of the people on the phone. I'm also with the Stroud Water Research Center, and Anthony Optumkamp on the phone is also with Stroud Water Research Center. Um, Maybe while we're waiting for one or two minutes, we can get a, uh, if people are on the phone would like to introduce themselves, we can go through that pretty quickly. Uh, Bill, well, maybe we'll start at the top of the list. Can you hear us okay, Bill? I can. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep, Bill Brown with Pennsylvania DEP. And maybe John? Uh, John Yagacic with the Delaware River Basin Commission. Okay, we finally got somebody. Okay, uh, Mosin, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, can you hear us okay? No, not yet connected to audio. Oh, okay. 
How about uh, Nick Colas? You're up in New York. You want to just say hello and where are you from? Right, Nick Colas, uh, Cayuga County Department of Planning and Economic Development. Okay. Uh, Nick Decker, are you on the phone? Maybe not, I guess. Okay, how not, about not uh, yep. Richard, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, this is uh, Richard Friesner. I'm with the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. And I guess Steve, if Kerlin, if, do you want to just say hello? Yeah, hello, this is Steve Kerlin. I'm the Education Director at Stroud Water Research Center. Nice to meet everyone. Okay, thanks. And Tyler, I guess uh, Andy already introduced you guys, so, um, but you can repeat. Yeah, this is Tyler Shank from SRBC along with Andy. Okay. And let's see, anybody else connected? Doesn't look like Nick, it. Nick Decker just connected to audio. Okay. Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Nick Decker, that is, yeah. We got two Nicks on the phone. Right. Can you hear us, Nick? That's okay. We don't have to put them on the spot. Anybody else on the phone uh, would like to introduce themselves while we're waiting? I think we're going to just start in another minute or two. All right. Nick Decker just said that he's he can hear us, but we can't hear him. So uh, we'll let him work that out. I'm glad that he can hear us. Um, and... Mosin is still trying to connect um, to the audio. I'll just type out a chat. Yeah, by the way, anybody who can't connect to audio, if you want to communicate with us, you can do it via the chat option. So if you click on the chat, and you can send us a, um, a message via that chat box down below. For some reason, you can't connect via audio. All right. Why don't we get started? Well, yeah, we can do that. Okay, again, uh, my name is Barry Evans. I'm with Penn State University, also an adjunct faculty member at the Stroud Water Research Center. And with me is Anthony Austin Camp, also of the Stroud Water Research Center. Uh, I want to thank those for joining us today. Um, most of these folks on the phone got an uh, invitation from me earlier. Um, I know most of the folks, a lot of the people on the phone have either worked with oh, me using MapShed or shown some interest in uh, MapShed. And we are going to talk today about um, an application called Wiki Watershed, or Model My Watershed, as you soon hear about, where we are incorporating some of the functions of MapShed into. And the way we're going to structure this is we're going to give a, a quick overview of the Wiki Watershed application, a little bit of history. Anthony will start with that. I will follow up with some discussion on MapShed and uh, how we're incorporating that into Model My Watershed. Uh, let's see, anything else we need to talk about at this point, Anthony, you can think of? Um, sure. So I muted a couple people due to uh, desk noise, and you can unmute yourself by going up to the blue bar at the top of your screen. And there's a big, uh, there's a bunch of controls there for the meeting, um, including uh, the mute me button. You can toggle on and off while while listening. Uh, it helps to all be muted. It just reduces the audio feedback and stuff, and makes it cleaner audio for the rest of us. Yeah, so, also if you're a cell phone like me, you can mute your cell phone as well. So Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess I'm going to start off by just giving a brief introduction of the Model My Watershed uh, vision and a little bit of the history and then do a bit of a demo of kind of the basic um, geospatial analysis capabilities, and also our site storm model, which we uh, implemented in a prototype version quite a few years ago, but now have reinstated um, in the new web app. And then I'll pass it over to Barry so that he can talk about 
the um, watershed multi-year functions that uh, we've enabled by incorporating code from MapShed, basically MapShed Online. So you can see here a qu quite a list of team of people who have contributed to this application over the years. And um, I'll just start by saying that it was, it was a, the, the initial vision um, came about as Susan Gill and I were discussing, who was our previous director of education at the Stroud Center, kind of discussing how to promote watershed education, how to promote watershed protection through sharing knowledge. And kind of the underlying premise behind all of our work here is that watershed protection um, is a fundamental ingredient for watershed protection is information getting out to the, pu the public and also to all the individuals who are trying to help watershed protection. Um, it turns out that even for professionals, it's really challenging to get a complete picture of all the information about that's going on um, for protecting a particular watershed, just because there are so many organizations that are collecting monitoring data, doing modeling studies, um, and, and then putting conservation practices on the ground, that it's incredibly challenging. We came up with this, with the vision for um, what we're doing now when Wikipedia and Facebook were really catching on as popular resources for connecting people, for collectively organizing the world's information through crowdsourcing. And then um, Google Earth in 2006 was launched by Google and it transformed the way all of us were able to explore features of the Earth. And what was amazing about resources like Wikipedia and Google Earth were that um, that it was equally in useful and interesting for the full range of potential users from um, middle school students and maybe even younger, um, all the way to uh, professionals and researchers. Um, Wikipedia and both Google Earth transformed the way we could find information and it was useful at almost all levels. So we came up with this concept of Wiki Watershed with a vision to create a web toolkit that kind of merged in some of the capabilities of those three uh, web platforms and now many other that have followed um, to create a toolkit that would support a wide audience of people interested in watersheds from citizens, conservation practitioners, decision makers, policy makers, researchers and educators and their students um, to all collaboratively work together to advance knowledge and, and therefore stewardship of freshwater resources. From the beginning, we envisioned three programs. The Model My Watershed web app would um, basically be the foundation where one could explore through a web browser, um, real geospatial data and um, allow users to uh, essentially um, outline areas of interest and then uh, simulate storms um, and how different conservation practices might uh, change runoff versus precipitation and water quality. Uh, we have envisioned also that Wiki Watershed would include some efforts to, um, for what we call Monitor My Watershed, uh, where we would be a one-stop shop for data. A lot of data sharing resources and capabilities uh, are now out there. Can we harvest all the monitoring data that's out there and put them into a place where we can encourage people to gain, gain understanding of monitoring efforts, plus be able to contribute their own monitoring data. And then uh, Manage My Watershed is kind of a combination of education about um, how, how citizens in, can interact with policymakers, but also a lot, quite a bit of social networking. So this was the combination the, the found of what we envisioned as the Wiki Watershed Program. The Model My Watershed effort was funded first by the National Science Foundation in 2009, and then in 2014, um, the William Penn Foundation funded us for the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, um, and the National Science Foundation again funded us to take the prototype that we had developed and, um, and turn it into a national scale resource for education on watersheds. So already we were getting funding. We already have gotten funding from two different um, large funding organizations uh, with two different audiences in mind. So we've, 
developed model my watershed version two to kind of distinguish it from the prototype that uh, unfortunately was deprecated due to changing web technologies. Um, to include capabilities with a really easy to use web user interface that was completely redesigned for cl clean looks and ease of use. Uh, adding geospatial data analysis capabilities. We wanted to enhance community features, basically the save, share, and compare work that, that users might develop on water protection scenarios. Um, we wanted to add in the ability to, um, uh, to discover, uh, access, and even visualize um, weather and stream monitoring data. We've incorporated uh, stream network capabilities and the ability to do watershed delineation. And then we've added in um, our previous prototyped model package, which we call the site store model. It's designed for smaller sites and it's a, it's a combination of the algorithms that Robert Pitt um, built into the urban small storm hydrology work that um, is now incorporated in the commercial software called WindSlam. Um, and outside of urban areas and in larger storms, it defaults to um, runoff approaches used in TR55. And more recently, we've incorporated some of the water quality outputs from the algorithms that are in EPA's Step L spreadsheet model for single storm water quality calculations. And in July, we launched um, the new model package, which is based on MapShed. Uh, which allows multi-year daily, simulation, daily simulations um, over decades of historical climate data for watershed scale, um, nutrient and sediment runoff uh, estimates to, in order to support TMDL development, and most recently MS4 permitting. So this is where I'm gonna uh, jump away from from PowerPoint and go entirely to the web. So all of these, all of what I'm about to show is available right now live. Um, if you go to wikiwatershed.org, which is our, our website where we're putting in, um, where we're building out the capabilities for, uh, for all of the various wiki watershed tools. And this is the landing page. You can see we have many different programs. Some of them I mentioned earlier. Some of them are slightly new, uh, Enviro DIY Leaf Pack Network. We might talk about those at the end. But um, all of you can access most of what I'm going to show and what most of what Barry's gonna show by hitting the launch the app button right there. However, I'm actually gonna do most of this demo in our staging area. You can also get to that, it's public, but this is basically where we are beta testing every release that we do just before we release it. And one of the reasons I'm gonna start here is because there's some exciting new features that um, I'm quite interested in, in demoing with the rest of you. All right. Um, so all of you can, I just moved my various controls. So as you can see, this looks like a standard map, but there's quite a bit of capabilities here under the feature. We want it to be easy bar to entry, but power controls underneath. Um, we actually have, this is an open street map layer, but we can use all the Google layers uh, to look at satellite, or we can, of course, we can also look at Esri satellite imagery. So we have a lot of capabilities for base maps. I prefer the simple terrain map because we then get to add in our own customized model my watershed overlays. And one of my favorite is the National Stream Network. This is based on, on uh, NHD plus data sets that is, a, that is basically a, a USGS product that is, has value added attributes um, by EPA. So we, you can see that it auto, auto populates the stream network as you drill down into smaller and smaller units. Um, and I think that's actually the full extent of the NHD plus flow lines. Within the Delaware, we've done a lot of prototyping of a lot of things. Most of what we're gonna show you is available all over the country, but in the Delaware River Basin, there are some additional features due to the funding from the William Penn Foundation. And here we have first order streams um, that come from a 10 meter DEM as processed by David Tarboten's group um, and the Taudem uh, 
uh, terrain analysis model. So we're going to look at stick with this data set here. The other thing that we've enabled is the ability to look at different boundaries. So we can look at um, huck, huck units of, of any size. Here I have huck 12s. Um, or we can also look at county lines. Those are too big. Congressional districts, um, school districts all over the country. And in, the, in Pennsylvania, we've actually put in Pennsylvania municipalities to talk to help um, demonstrate how we can do MS4 permitting. And, and Barry's going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But the really exciting stuff, and I'm going to zoom out a bit so you can get the effect, is that we can we can do high performance, um, almost supercomputing geospatial analysis and visualization. So this is the 30 meter NLCD for the entire country. And just to show you how quickly it renders, this is our staging server. This is our slow server. And I'm just re rendering the NLCD for the entire, all of North America. Um, and uh, with all the different land use classes. So this is why I like the terrain, the terrain base map because we can zoom in to our backyard and um, and kind of modify the transparency and and see some some kind of quasi hill shading with our land use. And if we really want to zoom in, of course, we can switch to satellite so we can see how that overlays, which is really nice. We also have um, built in the um, G Sergo hydrological soil groups that are used for our modeling um, efforts. There are other layers that we're working on visualizing right now, but I'm going to stick with NLCD. The last thing I want to demonstrate before we start selecting areas of interest are, are that we're, we've started to build in the ability to find observations for um, for anywhere uh, in, in the Delaware River Basin. These are all prototype for the Delaware River Basin. So if I click on the USGS points point, for example, under, under um, observations, you can see all the USGS points in the Delaware River Basin where they've got water quality monitoring stations. I can also click on the Delaware Environmental Observing System, which is primary climate network. And lastly, um, within the Delaware River Basin, we've implemented the NPDES database. So all NPDES uh, dis point source discharges are in the map. So now we can, we've can we populated the map. You can browse around on this map and do things like click on a point and find out what's going on with um, oxygen concentrations, for example, at this particular USGS river gauge over the last 30 days. And so it's got really wonderful um, uh, ability to, to observe data. We don't yet have download capabilities uh, enabled, but that, that will be coming. Um, we can do the same thing for weather data. Um, oh, so that one just didn't load. I'm not really sure why. Um, so we've got uh, weather data and um, and as I pointed out, NPDES uh, data. So that one has no data. Let's see if I can find one that does. So we have average annual loads from each of the NPDES points. So with all this data at our fingertips, we can start to do geospatial analysis. But to do the geospatial analysis, we have to pick an area of interest. And there are lots of ways for us to do it. And you can begin seeing some of these methods here at the top of the page. Um, one of the things to point out is that we've got this exceptionally high performance geospatial engine under the hood. And I'm going to just do a free draw of an area just to give you an idea of, of how, you know, how this thing on the fly without any pre-computed results can do things like tell you what the total area is that you selected. And you can be very detailed and zoom in and be very precise about how you draw these shapes. Um, summing up the land use characteristics, the soil characteristics, and these colors serve as a code for what you're seeing over here. Again, again we can change the transparency so that the so that it's an exact match, or we can kind of lighten it up a little bit so you can see the base map underneath. Um, and we even have some estimates that we use in MapShed, which you're going to see in a moment for things like animals and point source data. We um, 
have discovered a, a this is this is only on staging, so this is still in process. And we've got a little glitch where we're not actually um, listing out all the NPDES areas. This this feature wasn't even available um, a week ago, so it's a pretty new feature. Um, but eventually, we'll have a list and a total total sum of all the all the different point source loads within the area of interest. So I'm going to go back and reset that because there are other ways to select areas. There are all the predetermined boundaries that we have, so we can, for example, enable HUC 12s to be selected, um, or we can also, within the Delaware, we can also delineate the watershed. So I'm going to reset that and zoom in to our neck of the woods right here uh, upstream of the Stroud Water Research Center, which I know well. So if we go into here, I can click click on any point like that right there is our gauging station. And this is running um, live a terrain analysis using the 10 meter DEM and delineating that watershed right there um, live on, this, on the spot. So it did, once, once an area of interest is delineated, Using any of the tools that we have, we then have um, have this analysis. Now, the thing of interest here is this model button that allows us to then take all the data that we've kind of pulled together um, on the Amazon cloud and do something interesting with it, basically make a prediction out of it. Barry's going to talk about the MapShed implementation, what we call the multi watershed multi-year model, and I'm going to talk about the site storm model and then hand it over to Barry. The site storm model has been around for a little bit longer, um, so we've refined it a bit more. Um, so what I just did is that it, it runs that combination of, of um, Win, the, win, this, the algorithms in WinSlam with tier 55 for non-urban areas and, and larger storms with um, step L to, to basically partition a rainfall event of any size um, into evapotranspiration, infiltration, runoff. There's the ability to modify the 24-hour storm and rerun the model for that 24-hour storm and see how that water gets um, partitioned off between those three uh, bins and then uh, to see what the water quality loads would be off of that. So the microsites we have, since we developed this for education purposes, we've actually developed what we call the microsite storm model, which show which runs the exact same model algorithms for a combination of a single land use and a sin, single hydrological soil group. Um, still with the ability to vary storm size. And so you can see how um, this can illustrate what, um, what's going on in, in any single uh, pixel or actually group of pixels that share the same land cover and the same soil group. So um, this is actually the exact same calculation and can be used for its own purposes. That's, that's this, it's not just a cartoon, but it's actually the model behind the works here. So, this is all relatively interesting. Uh, what I could do is um, name the project to be uh, White Clay Creek uh, at Str Stroud Center um, for the sites model and save that. I can make that public. So once I do that, if I share this URL, I can email that to anybody, and anybody can see the work that I'm doing here. But the really interesting stuff is when we click on this new scenario. When I click on the new scenario, what it allows me to do is modify my, my watershed. So I know what my runoff um, is for what size storm mode. 2.5 centimeter storm, I'll make it a little more interesting. I'll make it a 11 centimeter storm here. Um, but what if I want to improve this? So I can do that by actually changing um, some of my land use or putting in conservation practices. So this, this landscape has quite a bit of um, agricultural land use, as we can see here. Hay pasture is a dominant form of land use. What if we 
planted a humongous forest in this part of the watershed. Um, and again, I can do this with quite a bit of precision. So now I've just made one modification to my watershed, that many square meters, and that will change the model result output. So let's do some other things. Let's say if we zoom into the Stroud Water Research Center here, um, let's say we decided to put porous pave, paving um, on all of our impervious areas. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a possibility. We could add that in there. Um, or let's talk about um, turning some of the row crop ag, which are these big brown areas, into um, no-till ag, for example. Right, so I could do something like that. And again, I can draw this as precisely as I want. And now I've got three modifications. What is exciting about this, of course, I can save that scenario and call it whatever I want to. Um, uh, you know, so I can call this um, uh, whatever. So I can call it whatever I want. And from here, I can then compare how the different options in this model um, might improve water quality and runoff. So you see here, this is what the ocean would look like if it was completely in a natural state of 100% forest. This is what the current conditions are. And this is what I've tried to do to improve um, runoff, et cetera, for the model. And, and they're all comparing the same size storm. And, and you can see here the, um, how things change from one storm to the other. They're still all running, so you have to wait for the things to all equilibrate here. So, so for that size storm, there's not a humongous difference, but there's a, a minor difference in the runoff. For larger storms, there's a, there's a big, bigger difference for those options. Before I hand this over to Barry, I'm going to mention one other thing, is that uh, I talked about saving and sharing these scenarios. You've just seen the ability to compare different scenarios within the same model run. But, but when I save, a, save work, I have this list of projects here. And so I can go back to them, um, make them, this one's public, I just made it public. Here are some private ones that I developed over time um, and different work that I've done over the last few months. Uh, so I can always go back and maybe finally make something public, share it with somebody, or continue to do work on it. So when you log in, all that work is saved from one, one day to the next. Any questions on this as I pass the presenter ball over to Barry? Anthony, this is Bill Brown. The, the G Sergo and those are those are available just uh, at, for across nationwide. How much of what you just showed, if anything, I'm sorry if I missed some, were specific to the Delaware River Basin? Sure. Let me show you exactly that. Okay. So I'm going to just go back here. Everything you see here can be done anywhere with one exception, um, and that is the NPDES codes are presently only for the Delaware. We have plans to make them national, but that option is Delaware only. If you click on the overlay. Yeah, we, just, we just lost your screen share. Ah, right. Um, because I'm, I just shared it to, to Barry. All right, uh, let me take it back. Take it back. Let me. Take it back. All right. It's pretty easy for me to do. You should be seeing my screen right now. Is that right? Yes. All right. Unfortunately, we have a bug in compare, which we're working on, which puts this uh, infiltration thing from one screen to the next. And so maybe I will refresh my screen and I will, will show you all. There we go. What's what's available throughout the, um, 
throughout the country. So if it's something is only available for the Delaware we, or Pen the state of Pennsylvania, we state it really specifically for overlays. So for overlays, we have this highest resolution stream network only for the Delaware, but this stream network we have nationally. Um, we only have municipalities for the Delaware, well actually for Pennsylvania, um, everything else we have nationally. They're urbanized areas, which is an EPA data set. We presently only are showing for Pennsylvania, but um, also that could be done nationally. Observations are 100% for the Delaware only, including the point sources. Um, we have the capability of doing all this nationally. It's, it's really about who we're getting the money from uh, in order to prototype things first. Once we prototype it, that's the largest bulk of the cost of getting the thing to work. And then we just have to expand our resources and a little bit of extra effort to go national with it. So I think Barry is going to do a lot of his demonstration by um, going, by doing all of his work uh, outside of our region. So is that right, Barry? You're going to do that, right? Yeah, that's right. And and just to go back to your question, Bill, were you asking whether the G Sergo data uh, was available all over or in a specific location? I think I asked both, but but the the G Sergo, uh, yeah. Anthony answered a lot of them in in terms of what's available nationwide. What and what about G Sergo? G Sergo everywhere. everywhere. The, the nationwide. Community. Yeah, the NLCD, this is what he's showing right now is the g data. That's what we're using as our base soils map right now anywhere in the U.S. So that's a 30-meter soils data. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Right. And we're, we're, we have a number of data sets under the hood that we're not visualizing, and we're in the process of trying to bring those to visualization. So everything that we analyze for a model, we also – want to be able to visualize, but not, it's not all there yet. Um, we're realizing as we expand this list, we have to improve the navigation of all these different layers. Okay. So, and I'm sorry, to, I don't want to draw this out. So if you were to, like some of our MS force, it's important for them to get the hydrologic soil group. They could put up the, the G Sergo data, do a free draw, and then analyze, and, and under the analyze the results, it would come out with what the distribution might be in that, in that delineated area? Absolutely. That's correct, Bill. Perfect. So Thanks, I'm going to go, I, I can just show that super fast. I'll select a, a HUC 8 out here. Um, never been to this part of Pennsylvania. Uh, a HUC 8 out here in western Pennsylvania uh, that is potentially of interest to Bill. The Clarion River and you'll see here in a moment that um, we're going to analyze the, the all the all the data for NLCD land classes. And then for soil, like I said, GSERGO is a huge deep database. And really right now, what we're visualizing and, and analyzing is primarily these hydrologic soil groups. But, but Bill, you'll see um, everything that we're using uh, in MapShed is coming from GSERGO now instead of the more generalized soils data we have been using. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, everything. Yep. So, Anthony, we're we're about twenty up. We probably should move on. So, uh, yes, give people enough time to ask questions. And we're going to try to keep this to an hour. I mean, if people want to stay on longer, that's fine. Okay, uh, you got the ball. Yeah, let me just make sure. Okay, you got mine, right? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Well, what, I, what I'm going to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of people on the phone who have used MapShed or have been exposed to it or I've had discussions with about using it, but it may not be familiar to everybody who's on the phone here. So I'm going to give a very quick overview of the desktop version of MapShed and its precursor, AVGWF, just so you have some more context in terms of what we're trying to build into the web-based uh, model my watershed application. So very quickly. Uh, MapShed is a GS-based watershed modeling system. It's been in development for a number of years. Uh, it was developed by my group at Penn State University. Uh, just in terms of a brief history, we started developing the precursor to MapShed about 15, 16 years ago. 
The base model we use is something called GWLF, the Generalized Loading Function Model. Originally it came from Cornell. Uh, we've now called GWLF-E for enhanced because of the number of oh, new routine, routines that we've built into it over a number of years. The first incarnation of this desktop modeling system was called AVGWLF because we used the ArcView 3.x GIS software package to display the GIS data sets. And at that time, because we used ArcView, we called it AVGWLF. Um, AVGWLF and MAPSHA has been used by the Pennsylvania DEP and a number of other government and research organizations, not only in the country but elsewhere in the world, uh, since about 1999. Uh, because of the proprietary software uh, that we were using, we decided to go to a non-commercial platform a number of years ago. That's we, when we switched to something called Map Window, which is a free GIS package that is available and started playing with that in about 2010. And the first non-beta version of that was released to the public in May of 2012. Uh, in terms of the core components, um, MapShed includes two basic parts. There's a GIS front end, which is used as a free processor to overlay and manipulate different GIS data layers and weather data for the purpose of creating an input file for the simulation model or the GWLFE model. This model is then used to run on the input files for the purpose of estimating or calculating nutrient and sediment and pathogen loads for a given watershed, nutrients being nitrogen and phosphorus. And there are various ancillary tools that can be used to visualize, evaluate, and compare the model output data. The way the desktop version works is you open up a little project manager, and then you start loading some data. You load different GIS data sets. Uh, you do this primarily by uh, filling out a list using browser buttons to identify where these da uh, different data sets are. You load the data. And by the way, this uses a lot of the standard data sets that a lot of um, GIS-based modeling systems use, like uh, soil, topography, land use, and so forth. And it's got, some, in Pennsylvania, we use some specialized data sets that we've created just for Pennsylvania, things like soil test P and background groundwater nitrogen and so forth. Once you have loaded the data sets, you can then identify one or more uh, boundaries of interest. In this case, we've uh, highlighted a number of sub-basins. We can then run the model on those sub-basins, and the user specified a period of simulation. You then run MapShed to create the input file. And once that's been created, you can then open up the GWF E model, which at this point is a VB executable. You can load the input file. You don't necessarily have to load it to run the model, but you can load the input data and edit any of those data set, uh, values that were generated by MapShed. For example, we have inf you can specify information on uh, farm animal populations or point source discharge information and, and a number of other ones. But you can review and edit the data, and then you can run the model. And the model gives you a number of different output types. Um, including yearly, monthly, and daily output on flow, nutrient, sediment, and pathogens. And this is just one example of uh, the output that many people use for TMDL purposes in Pennsylvania, where you're trying to ascertain what kind of loads are coming from what source areas. We also write output, again, this desktop version, to various Excel files that you, so that you, the user can use the uh, features within Excel to plot and um, display different types of information. I'll very briefly go over this. There are a lot of differences between the original GWLF model and the version we've developed called GWLF-E. I don't have time to go over all of them, but important to note is that we have a stream bank erosion routine that did not exist in the original model. We also have improved the urban area modeling routines uh, the author of GWLF, uh, Doug Hather Cornell, had developed a few years later a urban version of that model called Runfall, which had different types of urban routines running in it that were very similar to those used in the swim and storm models uh, used by EPA. And we have incorporated those into G the GWLF model, our, our version of it. We also have the ability to model different types of BMPs, both in urban and rural areas. 
We have also since uh, developed some attenuation and routing routines within our version of the model. Uh, and one by using that, one uses uh, defines flow paths and contributing areas. And again, I won't go into the details here. Um, once you've run a model, you can there are different display um, options that one could use. For example, one could take the output and show hot spots within a particular watershed in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment loadings. Um, and an important note, I think one of the more important features that we've built into the desktop version is the ability to simulate the uh, different levels of implementation for different uh, BMPs. With our tool, you can specify different levels of agricultural BMPs like conservation tillage and cover crops and riparian buffers and do something similar in urban areas. And then you can run the model and look at the difference. And here, for example, along this bottom row, these are just different values that were uh, generated using different levels of BMP implementation. Uh, another important feature we've added recently is the ability to well, support some types of MS4 urban area calculations. Um, regarding that, what we do is use an urban area layer, layer and this is uh, identified by these polygons in the background. Uh, if one loads an urban area layer, one can calculate a load for a watershed and then also figure out what the contribution is from these different urban areas within that watershed not only the loads that are generated within the urban boundaries, but also loads that are generated as a result of downstream stream bank erosion. And using our urban area tool, you can view the watershed uh, loads. This is similar to what you get by just looking at the load output with a GWF model. But what you can do, and I'll show this in another slide, you can also look at the contribution of different urban areas. So very quickly, that <laughs> wraps up the MapShed desktop version. And what I want to make clear here is that we are trying to build as many of the routines that exist in this desktop version into the web-based application that we've just been describing. And at this point, and MapShed, if you're interested, is available at this website. But let me now go to um, model my watershed. And let's see, let me get that open. Oops, yeah, what I need to do is get to, yep, get out of the way there, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna go to the same staging site that Anthony showed. So when I go to model my watershed, I'm presented with this screen. I'm gonna sign in as a guest, and anybody on the phone, you can do this right now if you want to. But um, I'm presented with the screen that I can actually go anywhere in the U.S. and do some uh, watershed modeling. I'm going to actually choose a site out in the middle of the country just to demonstrate that we have the ability to model at this point anywhere in the U.S. I'm going to go to a site in Missouri called Sturgeon. And just zoom out a little bit here. It zoomed, when I typed that in, it zoomed right on to the, to the town of Sturgeon. Again, I can use various tools here and turn on and off different layers, whether it's the national stream boundary or maybe a Huck 12 boundary and so forth. What I'm going to do is turn those off for now. Along the top, these options up here allow me to identify which specific area I want to model within. So I'm going to turn on the Huck 12 basins and I'm going to go to this one called Salem Creek. I'm going to click on this. And after clicking on it, uh, just like with the simple uh, site level model that Anthony showed earlier, uh, data sets are overlaid and clipped out, and we are presented with information on the land use, soils data, animal populations, and point source data, data coming from EPA data set uh, for this particular area of interest. At this point, I'm going to use the uh, our MapShed model, or that version of the model we've since implemented here, called the multi-year model. Clicking on that, uh, the, the so additional um, analysis is done, extracting information from those different data sets to create the input file 
for the GWLFD model. Now, I know there are a number of folks on the phone who have used the desktop version of MapShed and have done something similar to this. And this here is the HUC-12, just to give you some context, if I did the same thing using the desktop version, it would take about uh, maybe two or three minutes to clip out all the data. What we've done here is we've clipped out the data and run the model in probably under 30 seconds, which is pretty impressive, impressive I think. And so here we have on the right-hand side a summary of the same types of data sets you might get by running the desktop version. Not everything is there, but we have a good bit of it that you would see with the desktop version. Hydrology, uh, this is a summary of the water quality output. Uh, this would be familiar to some of you that have used MapShed, the desktop version. Now, what's important here to note, and I think this is real critical, um, Model My Watershed, you can actually do the modeling and use the results there, or if you want to refine the input, you can actually download a version right here and download what's export what's called a GMS file, which is our input file for the GWF E model. That's now been downloaded. I am going to open up that I've got the desktop version of MapShed right here. I'm going to open up the model. I can go right to that download file, the, that file I just created today. I can open that up. I can edit it right from here if I choose to do that. I can edit the point source data or animal data, et cetera. So this is a good um, tool to use for creating an input file where you know you've got to add some additional localized information too. Eventually, we hope to have more user interaction built into the model, the web-based version that will allow that type of, the same type of user interaction that we have in the desktop version. But for now, if you need that, you can download that input file. Okay, <laughs> that is a quick version of what you can do with Model My Watershed, very similar to what you can do in MapShed. Now, what I'd like to do very quickly is go over some of the things we'd like to do. Um, in the future, uh, as Anthony mentioned, this has not been uh, going on very long. We've incorporated a lot of the routines that exist in the desktop version in the web-based platform at this point, but that we've got a, a fair way to go before we have all of the bells and whistles built into the web-based application. For example, we would like to incorporate a number of other national data sets that exist out there to help establish more region-specific values for some of the various model input parameters based on regional differences. For example, um, we'd like to make use of the USDA cropland layer. Right now, we're only using the USGS NLCD layer to assign different values for different input um, parameters. But with the cropland layer, I know some folks on the phone are familiar with this. It's similar to the NLCD, but what you actually get for each cell is not only a value that represents hay pasture or cropland, but you actually get a number that represents a crop type, like for example, soybeans or corn or winter wheat. And we can use that information to better assign um, parameter values in the input file for different parts of the country. Uh, I've, I've identified a soil nitrogen layer that can be used to better estimate soil nitrogen values uh, nationally. Uh, same with the soil phosphorus layer I've identified. These are not yet built in, but these are things we'd like to incorporate. In terms of weather data, on the screen you might see that I've got in these red areas, in fact, by the way, I should have this in this note, uh, the red dots indicate the weather data that we are now using to drive the national version of Model My Watershed. At this point, we only have about but well, we have weather data, about 30 years of weather data for about 214 or 15 stations. But in actuality, there's data that US, well, that the Weather Service has for over 9,000 climate stations throughout the US. And we'd like to get to the point where we're using all of that data, not only to better represent weather patterns in any particular location, but actually take advantage of the more current weather data as it's up to the present, for example. Uh, another example is a base load index map from USGS. We'd like that to, uh, to use to set the recession coefficient within the model, but there are many other examples. 
the other thing we'd like to do is take advantage of the USGS NHD, National Hydrography Data Set, uh, data available uh, across the whole country. Uh, for example, in, in the Delaware River Basin, let me just go back to my slides. We are experimenting with using um, the NHD data to redistribute or recalculate uh, load information at the NHD catchment level below the NHD, uh, let's say, HUC-12 basin level and use data for different stream segments that's available for flow to calculate concentrations of things like mean annual um, nitrogen phosphorus concentration and low flow concentration. This is working in the Delaware River Basin, but we hope to implement this across the U.S. soon. Uh, what else? Um, we've talked a little bit about this MS4 urban area tool. Right now it is working only within the Delaware River Basin. Again, if I go back to my desktop version and zoom out just a little bit here, uh, let's see if we get the right here. We've got, for Pennsylvania, we've got information on urban area boundaries. This allows us to calculate and load for watershed and then estimate what the load contribution is for each of the urban areas within that watershed. Again, this exists now only for the Delaware River Basin, but th this type of data exists for the whole U.S., and we'd like to implement that uh, in the near future as well. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think I'm down to about the last slide. Okay, and then uh, just a few other improvements that we're looking at in the near future or maybe over the next year. We'd like to... Um, include the ability for users of the web-based platform to have more interaction with the input file that's created by Model My Watershed, that is to edit and refine the input. Right now, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to download the GMS file or the model input file. We'd also like to include the ability to use that compare function so that if you do numerous model runs, uh, you can compare the results and actually, by the way, we're getting close to two. If, if anybody needs to get off, I won't feel offended if you do that. Uh, but I do want to show one other thing with this um, with this tool very quickly. Like Anthony demonstrated with that simple site level model, we also have the ability to do some level of BMP implementation within the, uh, the MapShed version running um, at this level as well. For example. We can say, uh, what if we were to add cover crops to this area? Right now, there's a little under 5,000 hectares of um, row crops, and if we apply uh, cover crops to 60% of the area, the model is actually recalculating the loads and will present us with the information in just a second. So now we have new load information based on that. Uh, BMP implementation. So we can look at, for example, um, phosphorus, so that's about a little, over, a little under 11,000 kilograms. And if I were to go to the current conditions, I'll see that that was about a little under 14,000 kilograms. But what we would like to do is, as I mentioned this, this slide, is use the ability, it will use that compare function to compare those load runs, which right now we haven't implemented, but that's something we'd like to do in the future. And then lastly, uh, and this isn't by any stretch of the foot list, but we'd like to add some, um, there's some routines that exist within the GWFE model that we've implemented that handle tile drainage, but uh, we don't usually use that in the east, uh, eastern part of the U.S., but we have the ability to to simulate tile drainage, so we need an estimate of that. So we'd like to uh, build some algorithms in there to estimate tile drainage for different areas of the country for any watershed area that might be simulated. Okay, Anthony, I did my best to get that under about <laughs> two o'clock. So let's let's see. Should I hand it back to you, or maybe I should ask the the, the folks on the phone if there's anything that they might have questions about at this point that we can answer. That's a good idea. Quick one, Barry. 
so when, when Anthony showed the BMP implementation, he did a free draw on an area and put in a BMP. Is that not right now that functionality? You you entered an area, uh, kind of manually entered an area. Yeah, we we do, we do it the same way we do it the desktop version. We don't have that graphic interaction where you draw it on an area, but you basically just like the desktop version, you're given a number that represents how many acres there are, for example, there are hay pasture or cropland, and you say how much of that you're going to convert to or, or apply a different BMP to. So that's the way that works right now, but we've talked about adding that more interactive tool down the road. Got it. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, all right. We, we were scrambling pretty hard to get all of the map shed functionality that so that it would give you the same answer in a, in this web browser as you get uh, on a desktop, basically. Um, there are minor differences, but they're mostly due to, in many cases, improvements in the web application for the data sets under, underneath things. Um, but anyways, we what we want to do, there are many things we want to do next, and one of them is to harmonize the ways in which we add BMPs and perhaps to set up a, a scenario, even to be able to build a scenario and then and then model the scenarios and the two separate models. Right now, once you actually start a model, that's it's, that's when you build the scenario. So you actually, the, the, the projects are for a specific model at a time, unfortunately, right now, just because of the way it works. So for large areas, um, which maps, MapShed is really designed for these large areas, but, but Barry could have drawn in a, a tiny little Part, you know, a couple sets of parcels of a farm or something like that and run the model on a farm. Mm -hmm. Then, then uh, you know, so that's possible. Likewise, the site storm model, it is possible to run it on an entire HUC 12 or HUC 8 for that matter. But um, really, the, the two models are designed for different sized um, areas of interest. And therefore, the, the tools that we decided to implement, what the draw tools were for more the site, the site model and the Kind of more generic, like percent of, of available air, you know, row crop area uh, for the watershed model, so that you wouldn't have to go in and draw them all. Yeah, uh, thank just you. like Anthony said, I'm just I could just as easily draw a small area here and run the same model on it. And when Anthony mentioned earlier that rapid uh, watershed delineation tool. Uh, that is going to be implemented for the whole U.S. eventually. Right now, you have to pre-draw something that's different than how 8, 10, or 12 boundaries. That's right. Any other questions? We're really excited about getting this out now that we've got the capabilities launched since um, early July or end of June <clears throat> that, that you see here. We're still we're still very actively developing, and we have a, a, a release schedule about once every six weeks. We have a, a major release with new features, and what, most of what we showed you uh, is still on staging. We hope to release it quite soon. Um, uh, well, I would, shouldn't say most of what we showed you. There were some features in what we showed you that, um, that we're about to release to the public site, which we're excited about, mostly related to being able to visualize information about point source data and animal populations, and also um, the stream network capability, visualization capabilities are much better on staging right now. So we're actively developing, and we have plans to keep keep it going. And I can't remember if you mentioned this, Anthony, but um, right now we have that simple site level model, and then uh, different uh, components of the MapShed model. But mm -hmm. ultimately, uh, we've thought about having a number of other models build in as well, because a lot of the same data sets we use to drive these other models can be used to drive uh, some other models like SWAT, HSPF, and so forth. That's right. So we are in the process of submitting an invited proposal, kind of a renewal proposal, to the William Penn Foundation. And in that, we will almost certainly implement a stream temperature model and probably a, a stream network routing model kind of connected to that. Um, we'll continue to improve on a lot of the MapShed capabilities, and 
Uh, and yet the, we've developed a whole framework in a way that kind of geospatial analysis happens first, and then the modeling can happen after it, which means that we can implement really almost any, any set of models one could imagine that use the type of geospatial data that we use. By the way, so Anthony, and I have been talk Anthony and I have been talking a lot. Uh, we'd like to give the opportunity to other people on the phone if they have any questions. This is Richard from New Epic. Um, as your watershed size gets smaller in the tool, does the accuracy or the precision diminish? The accuracy is more dependent on the input data rather than the watershed size. It is true that the smaller you get, the faster it runs, but um, we don't necessarily have more refined data at the smaller level, although that's certainly going to change in the future because, for example, we used to only have generalized soil data like Statsco, and then it went to Sergo, and now we have G-Sergo, which is even more accurate. So as we get more accurate data, uh, at a lower level, the model will become more accurate. And in the Delaware River Basin, for example, we're starting to get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, but so it's, the, the land use data is one meter, I believe, right? We're getting one meter data from the University of Vermont? That's correct. And one meter DEM data are better, so the, the accuracy will improve as those data sets get more refined. But, but it probably is true in a general sense that if you model a smaller watershed, you probably will be more accurate in a way because as you get to very large watersheds, I'll say something like a HUD 10 or 8, uh, there are other factors that come into play like uh, travel time, attenuation that you have to consider. And we do have some attenuation routines, uh, very simple ones built in right now, which we hope to improve upon. But the inclusion of some of the routines that we have in the desktop version into the web-based application will improve the accuracy there as well. Same goes for comparing watersheds around the country. Are, because of the data sources, they're mostly national, is that right? So um, you can compare apples to apples from coast to coast? Or as you add data sources, is, is that comparison fall apart? Well, right now, you're, you're correct. We use national data sets, and we leave it to the user to maybe refine the input data. For example, I described how a user can download that GMS file and kind of refine it based on more local conditions. For example, you might have some in, uh, information on groundwater nitrogen levels that are better than what we um, estimate based on our algorithms. So if the user has better information, and for example, also with the farm animal populations, we use county level USDA estimates for things like dairy and hogs and so forth, but um, these are just estimates. A user may know their watershed well enough to be able to say there, there are X number of hogs or dairy within this particular area and refine that input file. Same with point sources. We use EPA point source data, which you know, it's not bad in some places, but not as good in other places. And it's only, it's better for the larger um, dischargers. But um, yeah, I think it's good for comparing um, different areas of the country using the same data set. It'll work that way. For the most part, um, the data uses the national data sets. So we do have the models, I should say, use the national data set. So we do have some things that are can only be visualized in uh, the Delaware River Basin, for example, such as uh, these USGS point sources, but that, but or not point sources. Well, we also the point sources, but these USGS gauging stations are only Delaware, et cetera. But um, those actually aren't presently used in the model. So we're we're kind of showcasing what's possible in terms of the data that we can aggregate and potentially employ. Um, we're doing a lot of that showcasing in the Delaware, but really almost all the models work on the national data sets. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Okay, so um, 
I think why don't we wrap that up? There are other things that we have uh, that are kind of part of this wiki watershed concept. Uh, one of the ones we're really excited about is Enviro DIY. It's using open source data loggers to collect data, and we've got some prototype um, uh, prototyping funds to basically develop a citizen science network that all streams sensor data to us uh, for the Delaware. But um, but I think that's all I need to say about that now. So we got lots of other things in the works, but we're really excited about this opportunity to talk to this group of people because we now that we've got, with the Delaware prototyping money, we were able to leverage the National Science Foundation money to do all this other implementation nationally, which we're very, very excited about. And I think it's, it's um, we, our our goal is to really bring it all nationally. So we're we're looking for interest and 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 more funds and uh, uh, and partners to to do that work. And Anthony, let me also mention here that this is the first time we've given a webinar like this. Uh, we hope to improve this a bit, but this I, I felt it was important to at least get. Um, this out there to people so they can take a quick look at it and get an understanding of what we've done in a short period of time. And by the way, we've only really started implementing the MapShed components since spring of this year, so we've gotten pretty far along. Uh, and we think that within another year or so, this will look completely different. It's going to be do a lot more than it does right now. But for those of you who um, have an interest in seeing this again, we do plan to have other webinars in the future. Some of them will be uh, more generic like this where we may go over some of the same ground, but we may actually have some more specialized one down the road as well. We'll, we'll kind of play it by ear and see what works best, I think. All right. Any other questions? Then why don't we wrap this up. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. And we recorded this uh, WebEx, and we'll be posting that recording uh, at the, on that URL on, on the Wiki Watershed website. So if you have any colleagues who uh, might be interested in in seeing what we've done, um, you could basically point them to Wiki Watershed, and we'll post the recording here on this on this website for this webinar. And let me conclude, Anthony, by saying since I invited most of the people that are on this. Uh, uh, call the email. If you would like to have some questions answered and have some additional questions that you'd like to follow up with, please feel free to email me or call me, and I'd be happy to uh, fill in any of the details that weren't clear because, uh, during this presentation. So with that, I all guess right. I'd like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Really exciting. Cool. Thanks. We're excited. We are very excited. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.